Okay, welcome. Thanks everyone for joining. Um, welcome to the Remote Working at the Extreme session. Um, today we're going to be speaking to Dave Eddy from Extreme E and David Candler from Veritone. And um, we've got a really exciting session. Um, Extreme E is a brand new sport that launches in 2021. Um, you may have seen some coverage of it recently. There's been fantastic news about Lewis Hamilton, for example, launching his own team, um, along with Nico Rosberg doing his own team as well. So it's getting huge mainstream press coverage. But today we're going to be talking about the technical side, the workflows, how the team are moving to more cloud-based working, and it should be a really fantastic session. So by way of introduction, we've got Dave Aidy, who is the Head of Broadcast and Technology for Extremely, and David Candler, Senior Director, Customer Solutions for Veritone. And I'm chairing the session today. My name is Ben Folks, and I'm the Managing Director and Founder of Base Media Cloud. So just to tell you a bit about our company and what we do, um, we're really proud to be a sponsor of this year's um, Sports Forum with Broadcast. And we've been working in the sports broadcast industry for some time. Um, myself and a lot of my team come from sports backgrounds, having worked in shows such as Formula One and Red Bull Air Race and, and various international sports over the years on the post-production side. Um, when we launched Base Media Cloud in 2015, um, we had a big focus on sports storage and distribution. The, um, the way that we describe what we do is that we provide a platform for storing, managing, and delivering your content all under one roof with full support and managed services wrap. Um, and here's a list of some of the people we're working with. So in the sports sector, we've got a huge range of clients and um, a fantastic partner for us is Aurora Media Worldwide, who are actually the host broadcasters for Extreme E and have you know, partnered with us on this platform that we're gonna to discuss today. Um, we've recently signed Extreme E, hence today's session. And we also work with big brands like Copper 90, BBC, and Pro 14 Rugby, and many, many more. So onto the actual platform and technically how we deliver services, we have the concept of multi-cloud services, which in, in simple terms, it means combining services from multiple clouds into one fully managed service. So you just go to one provider, it's all looked after, um, no stress, no hassle. At the core of it, is centralized cloud storage. We have a major global partnership with IBM and we have a very unique S3 storage offering with those guys. Um, uniquely, we don't charge egress fees or API call fees. So when you're doing big distribution workloads like Extreme E, it's a huge cost saver. Um, and then along the top of this diagram, you can see various service modules. These are different software as a service products that we've integrated with, best in class partners all around the world. And it allows you to do all sorts of things like automating the delivery of content into the cloud or file sharing between teams, perhaps remote working and um, with Adobe edit suites, all the way through to transcoding, media library management, AI and streaming. And you know, 70% of the services on this diagram are actually gonna be leveraged by Extreme E from next season. And we're gonna dive into that with David Candler shortly and explain more. One of our major media library partners is Veritone. Um, and next up is David Candler, just to give you a, a brief overview of who Veritone are and how we work together. So over to you, David. Yeah, hello, um, I'm David Candler, the Senior Director of Customer Solutions uh, at Veritone. And uh, basically Veritone, uh, if you don't know, we, we're the creator of the world's first operating system for artificial intelligence. So we've built this uh, platform, which you can compare to a traditional computational OS. Uh, but we've done it in the in the cognitive sense to bring bring about the best of breed of of over uh, seventeen categories of of cogn cognitive capabilities. So uh, we've been around since two thousand and fourteen, um, and we're we're basically uh, the HQ is in Costa Mesa, California, but we've got offices all over North America and here in London. Um, particularly for sports, uh, we we have lots and lots of. Uh, sports uh, federations and organizations working with us all over the world there's a sample uh, of some of them um including you know formula e and extreme e obviously um you know what we're doing there is we're essentially using the aiware platform to turn unstructured uh, to structured content content into structured content you know we we hyper index assets for discoverability etc um, and we've also got a cloud native uh, platform media hub it's called Digital Media Hub, and this is, enables sports organizations to provide global access to their assets. Um, we, we effectively, if you strip it all back, we'd use the power of AI to create efficiencies in the workflows and operations, which we'll go into, but we also enhance monetization opportunities, and we represent some of the major 
major sports federations around the world in terms of content licensing. So that's just a, a, an overview of Veritone in the sports industry. Thanks, David, that's great. Um, and just to explain how we work together, um, Base and Veritone partnered nearly four years ago um, to produce a multi-cloud sports distribution service in the cloud, um, originally picked up by Formula E and Copper 90 and, and now by Extreme. Um, and we've got Dave Aidy with us from Extreme. Dave, would you mind just um, introducing yourself, your role, and giving us the kind of elevator pitch for Extreme, please? Sure, thanks, Ben. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Dave, Dave AD. Um, I'm uh, the head of broadcast and technology for Extreme, which um, essentially is an, an overview title. We have a number of different uh, service providers that provide the services to us. Uh, I did work for Formula E for four years uh, prior to this. But uh, let me have the opportunity to give you a little bit of an insight into what we're doing. So, Extreme e is a totally new concept in motorsport. It's groundbreaking in, in every respect, the car, the race format, the broadcast coverage, the locations, and the environmental legacy projects and the logistical challenges that come about in bringing this championship from, from a vision to reality. You know, within in the last 18 months, we've had to design and build a fleet of electric SUV beasts, and they are massive. Uh, they boast 550 brake horsepower, 400 kilowatts, 0 to 100 kilometers per hour in four and a half seconds, and a top speed of 200 kilometers an hour. And they're built to withstand the rigors of any sort of off uh, extreme off street uh, off road racing, um, only in the mountains, the deserts, the dunes, forests, and glaciers. Uh, we've also had to research some of the most remote and environmentally damaged locations on our planet, you know, Brazil, Senegal, Greenland, uh, South America, and design a racetrack that will not only showcase the car, but highlight the climate changes we all face whilst still engaging the viewer. You know, we filmed the two-day event with a team of only about 30 production staff, no infrastructure, power or internet, we have to distribute all of that content to a potential global audience of 177 million viewers. So everything we need, we have to be self-sufficient. We have to take it with you. And yes, we bought a ship, uh, the MV St. Helena. Before Christmas, it set sail on its low carbon footprint journey to the first destination. So you might think it's a mission impossible, um, but that's the challenge we have. Fantastic. Thank you, Dave. And shortly, we're going to show you um, a film, a, a promo of the series. I'm going to actually switch to um, broadcast this with you. The world's most powerful off-road electric vehicle competing on the world's most remote racetracks, highlighting the world's most imminent threat. This is Extreme E. We got all electric race cars racing on bespoke racetracks in some of the most extreme environments in the world. An electric SUV race that is going to take these cars to the most remote and most damaged corners of our planet. Using sport as a way to highlight climate change is very important. This is going to be the most extreme form of motorsport. <laughs> Each bespoke track will be designed on land already devastated by climate change. Teams containing two drivers each will be going head to head and marking an historic first for motorsport. The driver lineup will be equally split, 50% male and 50% female, with teams orchestrating a strategic driver swap halfway through each race. This creates a platform for female drivers to develop and become the fastest drivers in the world. Some of the biggest names in motorsport will take their place behind the wheel of the most robust racing car ever built. I can't wait for X44 to take part in a new racing series, and it's amazing that we can do so whilst raising awareness of the climate crisis. All-purpose, multi-versatile tyres designed by Continental will provide unrivaled grip on ice, sand, rock, and mud. A chassis made from durable, lightweight, and heat-resistant niobium and a 400 kilogram battery that will give drivers 550 horsepower and a thousand newton meters of torque. The second that you get on the throttle, the thing wants to just jump forward. Our Extreme E television output 
will create content across sport, adventure and the environment. Our live broadcast signature will use state-of-the-art technology, including manned and remote drones and land cameras. The coverage will incorporate virtual and live augmented reality graphics, all of which immerse the viewer in the unfolding dynamic action. A team of industry-leading scientists have joined our race for a greener future. They'll provide unrivaled insights into the regions where we compete, guaranteeing we race without a trace. And when the checkered flag falls, our legacy program will ensure that Extreme E leaves a lasting difference in each and every location. We want to bring awareness, we want to showcase electric cars, and we want to leave behind a legacy linked to climate change and to pollution. We're looking at long-term renewable energy solutions, so solar power, wind power, um, and then on the environmental side, NGOs that are working to counteract uh, the effects of, on the climate change environment. Teams, drivers and sponsors from around the globe are about to join forces in making Extreme E the next most talked about sports media property in the world. Extreme E, a sporting and adventure odyssey for the next generation. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Rich, for that. Um, I'm just going to switch back to the main presentation again. Um, Dave, that really gave us a fantastic overview of what Extreme is all about. Can you give us a bit more about your kind of mission and, and the four pillars, please? Sure. Well, we, we, we have these four pillars based around entertainment, environment, electrification and equality. And it, it's not just about having a race. There needs to be more of a narrative behind what we do, more of a purpose for the sport. So it, it is a race, but it's more than just that. It's, it's, it's entertainment. We want to bring entertainment to, um, you know, to, to the demographics we, we're hoping to, um, to, to have some interest in. The environment is absolutely key. Um, Alejandro Agag, that is the founder, he also founded Formula E, and they have uh, very similar values in terms of uh, sustainability, climate change, and in, in doing so, the electrification of, of vehicles, and not just vehicles. You know, there is, um, I know Alejandro's talked previously in the press about starting an electric powerboat racing series. So, you know, electrification, which will help the environment and sustainability is you know, the third sort of key pillar of our mission. And the, the, the fourth one is equality. And, and this is why I think people like Lewis Hamilton have, uh, you know, are, are keen to, to join with us in this. Um, you know, we, we, we're probably one of the first uh, motorsports to uh, ensure that each team has a male and a female driver. They're not competing in, in different elements of the championship. Each team has one each and they, they both have to do laps in the car. Um, and, and that sort of drives the whole development program for, for women in sport. And, you know, we can take that a step further as, as Lewis Hamilton is doing with, um, you know, uh, enabling um, people from less well-off backgrounds to be able to have some route into something like motorsport. You know, it shouldn't be a middle-aged male-dominated sport. So those, those are the four sort of three, uh, four E's that um, that sort of um, are the key pillars to what we're trying to achieve. That's fantastic. Thank you. And and let's just dive into what viewers can expect to see as well. So when, when you go live next year, um, can we talk through how it's going to be formatted, a bit about the racing? That'd be fantastic. Sure. Well, I don't know if there's a, a slide you can see, um, uh, a sort of a map of where we're going. But essentially, we have five different locations around the world for season one. It's only limited to five because we're taking everything on a ship. So um, it, you know, it takes time to get from one place to the next. In each of the locations, we have two days of racing. It's a 15 minute races. We'll have heats, semi-finals. We even have a thing called a crazy race. And then we have the final. And it's all about short, sharp, adrenaline filled races. You know, we, we know that for a lot of people, um, it's value for time that's important rather than value for money. So having these short 15 minute races is, is key to that. Currently we have nine teams competing. Um, we've already mentioned Lewis Hamilton, Nico Rosberg. We have uh, Chip Ganassi from the States who does IndyCar, who's, uh, who's also forming a team. 
And uh, as we've mentioned, you know, two drivers per team, one male and one female. Now, when we look at the sort of the broadcast output, <clears throat> our aim is to produce, you know, pretty sensational race coverage. And as we saw in the video, um, you know, we're utilizing track cameras, onboard cameras, uh, point of view cameras that are embedded in, in places of jeopardy, like water features and jumps, uh, racing drones. So that's going to be really interesting. These, these racing drones we have go up to like 92 kilometers per hour and they'll be tracking the cars. Uh, so you'll get really close to the action. We're using a lot of uh, virtual reality and, and augmented reality uh, as well in the TV output. Uh, and of course, all the timing and telemetry data that we get off the cars um, completes the picture for some fan engagement with the TV product. The circuit's about 10 kilometers uh, long. The drivers complete a lap each uh, and there is a driver changeover halfway through. Um, there are no track limits or boundaries. If you imagine uh, something like a sail GP or any sailing event where you have wayfinding markers and gates well they have to go through the gates and the around the wayfinding markers but the interesting thing is that you know each driver and each can, team can find what they think might be the best routes to get around in the fastest possible time and i mentioned you know jumps water features we've got gorges um, what we do have is a jump whereby e each of the cars has to go over the jump the one that achieves the longest distance actually gets a, a power boost for the, the the second lap of the race. Amazing. So now that's the production side. And then in terms of distribution, all the sessions are streamed. All two days are streamed live on, on all of our digital platforms. And then we conclude the racing on day two with a live two hour transmission program, which is the world feed. And we distribute that to our global set of rights holders. Um, not only have we got the live programming, we've got magazine shows, we've got documentary series and, and of course, social media clips to, to keep people entertained in between the uh, in between the events. It's amazing that the scale of the operation already um, pre launch Fantastic. Um, and, you know, clearly we've, we've covered in, in the intro some of the um, the focus of Extreme on the impacts of climate change. But can you talk us through this in a bit more detail and also let's discuss kind of how important it is for you guys to engage a supply chain that is following the same type of cultural attributes as Extreme Eat? Yeah, well, we have five sort of core principles of the Sport for Climate Action Framework, and we want to embed those principles in our championship. And, you know, it's important that we uh, engage with companies that have a, a similar philosophy. Um, now, <laughs> Along with this, it, it creates some some challenges for us. Some of them are, you know, are, are, are natural challenges because of the locations we go to, um, and uh, some of them are, are self inflicted. You know, the, the one of the key challenges to producing a compelling live TV show is, you know, fast moving moving action over difficult terrain, remote locations. Um, we need infrastructure, and where we're going, you know, there there isn't any. But, you know, with those challenges comes innovation. Um, just back to some of the, you know, the, the, the climate issues, um, you know, we are a sustainable championship. Uh, for our power, for example, we use uh, hydrogen fuel cells to create the power that charges the car. So that zero emissions. And we create that hydrogen actually at track. We don't uh, buy it in and then store it in tanks and bring it around. We actually create it at track. And then for our sort of utility power and technical power, we use HVO fuel. It's, um, it's one of the cleanest fuels you can get. It's a second generation synthetic uh, advanced biofuel. Um, it eliminates up to 90% of the net CO2, um, significantly reduces um, nitrogen oxide, particulate matter, uh, and carbon monoxide emissions. Um, and I mentioned everything travels in our ship, the St. Helena, which we've had refurbished and the engines refurbished so that we can run on low, so low sulfur fuel. And by going on a ship rather than flying, it's 75 percent less carbon emissions than flying. So you can see that. Um, 
be, because we want to have the sustainability, uh, we want to look after the environment, we want to sp uh, shine a spotlight on you know, the, the global crisis, we need to be uh, not just paying lip service, we need to you know, be taking action ourselves to show that we are aiming to be as, uh, as carbon neutral as we, we possibly can. And there's a lot of things that um, you know we we can do to to, to help that. Um, if, if you think about uh, our, you know our TV compound needs to be self-sufficient with equipment, power, distribution, communications. We want to keep resources at track uh, to an absolute minimum, which is why we're deploying the remote production, you know, and camera feeds and a race cut being created on site. Everything else, along with the telemetry data, will be backhauled um, via resilient satellite feeds to a production gallery in London. And that's where you know, data, graphics, commentary, etc., uh, will all be added live to, to the world feed. And you know, with that technical setup of less than a week and minimal staff on site, you know, we, we, we still have to create exciting race footage on beaches, dunes, valleys, etc. And we've we've talked a bit about you know how our production partners are are helping you know, Aurora Media in collaboration with NEP, um, you know not only in terms of uh, technological innovation things that haven't been done before in in motorsport, but all of that um, is uh, is a, is a sort of the backbone to keeping things uh, sustainable and keeping our environmental footprint down. Um, similarly, with uh, our data and telemetry, uh, our, our partner company Alcamel Systems in Spain, you know, they, they have challenges in harvesting hundreds of pieces of data, battery usage, braking, suspension, displacement, G-forces, etc., and, and feeding that back to the live TV program. And their solution is, is equally innovative and, um, and, and also sustainable. So they create a resilient Wi-Fi mesh network of, of nodes and uh, they're all powered by solar panels. So there's no generators, there's no cables, you know, all contributes to that aim of you know, minimizing our carbon footprint. Um, so, you know, ev everything we do is based around those four key pillars, but also, um, you know, adhering to those uh, principles of, you know, sport for, for the climate action framework. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and and the the production side of it's obviously all being done remotely, and, and it's a huge undertaking logistically. And then the the distribution part, which um, David Candler is going to explain in more technical detail, is also being handled in the cloud. Um, we have built a platform for Extreme E, which combines IBM Cloud Storage and Accelerated Transfer Services with Veritone's Digital Media Hub um, Asset Management and Delivery System. Um, and it's a, a base managed service. So we do all the build, the integration, and then and manage the support. And um, so David Candler, could you just talk us through what it is that we've actually built and, and some of the workflow details, please? Yeah, I'll be happy to. Um, so basically, yes, the integration there, it's a, a, what I would call a cloud native integration because we're all uh, basically you know, built out and managed in, in the cloud. So uh, Veritone Digital Media Hub is uh, hosted in AWS. And basically, um, you know, we're, we're fairly agnostic when it comes to AWS or IBM or Microsoft Azure. And in this case, we're working with our technical partners base to provide the accelerated uh, transfer or upload and download uh, in, into the object storage, which is IBM Cloud. And then we, you know, we have an automated watch folder where Digital Media Hub reads the content. So really, you know, what, what this is doing, it's, it's taking place at the heart of the production. Um, uh, where multiple production companies, you know, or partners can coordinate uh, uh, upload and then we can standardize media delivery. So you can see uh, Aurora Media there, North One and Extreme, and there'll be others, uh, lots of contributors all over the world who we can, we can standardize that ingest, accelerate it into the object storage, and then basically provide instant access to all of the key stakeholders or rights holders uh, across the world, including broadcasters, sponsors, teams, and others as we grow. Um, and, that, and that is it in a nutshell. And uh, that's before we, we come on to the future and all of our other services, which we'll talk about in a minute, Ben. Um, and Dave, how will this cloud-based approach to distribution 
help you guys with your kind of mission to be sustainable and, and also scale the series really? Well, look, we're, you know, we're, we're a TV product, TV only product. We don't have spectators on site, uh, partly because we're so remote and partly because we, we, we don't, we, we race without a trace. We don't want people, uh, you know, damaging the already delicate, uh, locations that we're at. So, you know, being a TV product, uh, content is our most valuable asset and the robust management of that is, is a fundamental requirement. You know, we create content everywhere. We need to upload it from anywhere. Having secure storage is absolutely essential. And, you know, being able to manipulate, clip, transcode, any of that content from anywhere is, is key. Um, along with that ability to search, view and download, for, uh, not only for us, but also, you know, our rights holders and media partners. So, you know, the benefits of cloud production and distribution, you know, with, with base and Veritone is, um, you know, is, is a real, um, you know, it's a, it's a 101 for us. It's, it's what the initial building blocks that we need. And, and David, um, what makes the particular design and, and solution that we put together unique? Um, we, we've got about three minutes left. For the yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go very fast. <laughs> on I mean, yeah, we're, 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 we're a trusted partner, uh, I would say. We, we, we have related projects with former E, as you've mentioned, and we've already working with Royal uh, Worldwide. Um, we are environmentally aware, and that's, that's a big thing for Extreme E, we know. Obviously, working with public cloud infrastructures, you know, we, we can share this information, but, you know, fewer servers used, uh, few, less electricity consumption, um, you know, architectures designed at scale uh, for efficient energy use, et cetera, et cetera. And Veritone have just launched Veritone Energy. So, you know, we use AI to revolutionize or try to revolutionize the green energy by um, collating weather data, energy uh, demand, pricing data. And we've, we put that all into a central hub and we optimize smart grids to make clean energy production more predictive, efficient and cost effective. So we're, we're really aligned there as a, as a provider in terms of, uh, you know, the green aspects of this. Um, and then, you know, basically uh, we're already used, this solution is already used for some of the largest sports federations in the world. It's a fundamental part of the production process and it coordinates and simplifies the aggregation of content and metadata for multiple partners and then makes it easily accessible uh, to, to discover it, share it and provide, uh, you know, secure access and future permissions as it says so that's great thanks dave and then um, i'm going to just kind of summarize the the future options and the, the future thinking side of this design so one of the benefits of having a multi-cloud architecture and moving your data into the cloud and this this applies to all the different sports brands that we work with is you've then got a central hub which you can connect to multiple services as the business grows or as the brand um, grows and has different requirements so you know it, without speaking of a specific customer um, you can do things like remote editing you can spin up branded channels for streaming do automated distribution workflows and all of these things are readily available and can be seamlessly integrated So we've got one here, um, which other sports could be future customers using the model developed for Extreme E? Um, that's very interesting. Do you want to take that one, David? Uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're fairly agnostic at the moment. We, we work across uh, golf, uh, tennis, football, um, all of the, uh, you know, American collegial sports, etc. So, I mean, every, every sport creates content. Every sport needs to basically create efficiencies distribute, provide access, and, and more importantly, monetize. And that's exactly what our platform enables you to do. And a question for Dave Aidy. Um, are you planning to have an extreme e eSports strand and or rolling out a race at home game? Yeah, so I, I've seen a couple of the questions. Just to answer the first one, yes, it's all live. Um, the the uh, internet issue is we're, we're uh, piggybacking our data onto the video uh, onto the video feed. We will have minimal amount of data uh, of internet at track. Our ambitions obviously are to look at esports and gaming. If you think of Formula E and their ghost racing, uh, absolutely uh, not for season one. I hasten to add, so you know, don't get too excited. Let's do simple things really well. But over the seasons, that's um, that's obviously our our ambition and aim. 
That's fantastic. And um, David Candler, one of the questions is around AI and what, what kind of things can you potentially automate in the future? Because we're, we're talking about relatively manual work in the cloud at the moment, but what could you automate using AI in the future? Yeah, well, I mean, basically, um, you know, what we're doing, a lot, a lot of a lot of it is about discoverability. So even the simplest speech to text or transcription, cognitive engines can basically listen to the sport. And then basically when, uh, you know, broadcasters or rights holders go into the hub and they want to find content, they can use that uh, speech to text or the commentary reference point along the video's timeline to get to the point they need very quickly. Um, more than that, we've got multivariant search within the platform where you could, for example, search for an action by a, a person uh, with a logo in the background. You know, if you're, a, if you're an agency creating a, an advert, for example. So we've got multivariant search. Um, I touched on logo recognition there. Sponsorship is huge for all sports. So if you want to give a, you know, a, an ROI to your sponsors, you know, we can provide e exact airtime during your event. Um, and, you know, so, so all of these things, the list goes on. We've got um, nearly 20 uh, cognitive categories of, of AI where in the platform, all used by multiple different organizations to do different things. But, uh, but I, I think one of the key ones would be this uh, um, hyper-indexing for discoverability within the content coming into the platform. One question for both of you that I didn't get a chance to ask before is um, what you personally think the future of sport looks like or sports production. You know, are we going to move to 100% online working, do you think, off the back of what's happened to us in the last year? I'll go for Dave first. Um, you know, th th things things are changing. The broadcast industry was going along the remote production route. In any case, there are lots of benefits for that. Um, you know, th the attitudes towards things are changing, travel, environment, health, work-life balance. If you can avoid having to take people to track and they can work from home, for some people, that's better. You're reducing your carbon footprint. That's better. Um, you have the ability to work in multiple places, so that becomes efficient, you know, using data centers where you can get full utilization of equipment rather than having to take kit to, to track. It, it, it's all positive. You know, people want to access anything, anytime, anywhere, and um, I think we'll see a lot more of that going forwards not only in the production, but also the distribution, but also the way we consume content. You know, I said before, it's about value for time rather than value for money. Uh, so I think sports production and distribution will change quite significantly over the next five to 10 years. Yeah, yeah and, I, and I think the, uh, you know, the transition that we saw from file to, uh, so from tape to file really was accelerated by a natural disaster. Um, in this case, uh, COVID-19 has forced us into, you know, remote working in many ways. And I, I think that the, the transition has probably accelerated. Some people are saying up to five years. Some people are saying more. Uh, and I think that we're, we're all well positioned for that, you know, in, in terms of the infrastructure we've put in place. Fantastic. And I think we're, I think we're at time and we've got another session um, coming up soon. So, yeah, thank you very much both for your time. Fantastic session. Thank you. Thank Cheers. You. Take care.